All right, so now that we know production of the thyroid hormones, um, I want to talk about how we actually use the thyroid hormones um, to get them into circulation and to cause physiological changes. And so it actually starts with thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone. So this is the hormone that is going to be released from the interior pituitary that targets the tissue of the thyroid. So thyroid stimulating hormone binds to a G protein linked receptor. G protein linked receptor that results in an increase in cyclic AMP. So what's that signaling system? Okay, so it's a cyclic AMP second messenger. So uh, what are the effects and actions? Um, so before I move on, this is our thyroid follicular cell. Here is TSH binding to the TSH receptor, down like cyclase, cyclic AM, AMP, PKA. And you can see that this stimulates the thyroglobulin with all the mits and the dits to be pulled back into um, to pull, be pulled back into the cell. So it has a positive influence there, has a positive influence on um, mechanisms that increase cellular growth. Then we have this proteolysis and the hydrolysis to break up the thyroglobulin with all the mits and the dits into T4, T3 and T4 that then are released. Okay? So when we bring it back in, the proteolysis results in the release of T3 and T4. So this is kind of the mechanism that we're talking about right now. So what are these actions here? Um, of binding TSH to the TSH receptor. So we have an increase in the incorporation of iodine into thyroglobulin. Would you remember that that is part of the process of generating MIT and DIT, incorporating iodine into thyroglobulin on those tyrosine residues? We're also going to see an increase in oxygen consumption by the thyroid itself. We're also going to see an increase in glucose uptake and utilization. in the pino and the phagocytic activity. Uh, in particular, the pinocytic and the phagocytic activity is going to be at the epical membrane. Okay. So, we have things that are happening for the production of mitten dit on their way to T3, T4 production. O2 and glucose is to supply energy to the system and probably also to help supply that cyclic AMP or the ATP to be converted into cyclic AMP. And then we have this apical surface from the colloid into the uh, thyroid follicular cell uh, bringing in the processed thyroglobulin containing mitten. And dead, so that we can go through proteolysis and then release the T3, T4 into the bloodstream. Uh, so there's actually um, been developed a large number of antithyroid drugs. And so thyroid issues uh, do occasionally um, purpose, purpose, do occasionally happen within the uh, 
in the human population. And the drugs that are given, they, they basically are divided up into two categories of action. One is to inhibit iodide transport. into the follicular cells. So we don't have that iodide that comes in that then can be used to be incorporated in the colloid into the viral globulin. Uh, and then the other type of antithyroid drug is, is going to not prevent iodide from coming in, but will inhibit that iodide from being able to be incorporated in the thyroid globulin. So many of these drugs will be given um, to prevent uh, excess <coughs> function of the thyroid, things like overconsumption of oxygen, uh, over uptake of glucose. But there are also what are known as dietary goitrogens. Dietary goitrogens. that are going to also inhibit thyroid function. So when you have abnormal growth in the thyroid, it's called a goiter. Um, I'm sorry, say that again? Dietary goitrogens. These are uh, things that we consume that will inhibit thyroid function. So you would take that for hypothyroid um, type conditions. Um, I don't know as much about Hashimoto. Is Hashimoto a hypothyroid? So yes, probably. What are you saying about growth? Growth. So a goiter is is a kind of like a tumor. I mean, it's not really a tumor because it's a goiter, but it's a, a growth in the thyroid that increases thyroid function. So a goiter. How does it happen? So it could be because of genetic predisposition. Um, changes in, in dietary habits of iodine, things like that. Genetics is the, one of the bigger players, I believe. And so you you basically develop an overactive thyroid. And I don't know if you've ever been around anyone who has a overactive thyroid that's not like they're not medicated well, but they're they're kind of insane. They're they're pretty so. Uh, So, dietary goitrogens. Do you have another question, Sarah? What, what topic was it on? Hyper, in both of them, both hypo and hyper, they get pretty irritable. Hypo is, they usually have weight gain because it down regulates 
the oxygen consumption and glucose utilization. Hyper, they usually, like one of the, the dietary strategies for individuals to be treated with hyperthyroidism is they you give them high calories so that they <laughs> so that you're you're not putting them into a, a deep negative energy balance. Um, but they'll have things like hot flashes or at least at least excessive temperature, irritable, excessive temperature. Um, well that can you diagnose it that way? Yeah. All right, so um, the dietary goitrogens, these are things that you consume that will help you inhibit function. And one of the big dietary goitrogens are foods that contain thiocyanates. And what thiocyanate actually does is it will be competitive with iodine. And so when we get over here to this transport mechanism, where we're pumping the iodide ion into the cell with thiocyanates, will actually compete for that pump. And some of the thiocyanate will actually pump it in. Um, in preference of the iodide. Preferential transport into the follicular cells. And so the sources of thiocyanate in dietary goitrogens include many different types of fruits and vegetables. Fruits and veggies, um, and in particular, high thiocyanate levels in the brassica genus. Botanist, can you give me an example of a brassica? This is probably, yes, Brussels sprouts and another green one. Asparagus, but broccoli as well. So the answer to that, that is a funny question. Really not related to the class at all, but I'm. I'm so I'm willing to chase out. It's not related because we're not talking about urinary stuff. <laughs> so the answer is yes. It changes the smell of the urine, but you have to have the right alleles to smell it. So so yeah, I know. How weird is that? Like, why is that even a thing? So. Some people can smell it, other people cannot smell it. I can smell it. You sound so proud, but yeah, I got those. I don't know if I'm really proud because if you're in the bathroom, it's like, dude, cut back on the asparagus. It's disgusting. You can do it just like that if you're around someone. Big smile on your face, cut back on the <laughs> You've been eating a lot of asparagus lately, haven't you? So it smell it, it's I would describe it as a more pungent um more pungent caffeine type smell. Are y'all able to smell caffeine in your urine? So no? Yeah. Yeah, that's what yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, kinda of coffee kind of you kinda of make that a little bit more 
organic, I guess. I don't, I don't, I don't really know how to. Well, I'm, I'm saying like more like earth. <laughs> like more earthy, more, more dirty. I don't know, it's a weird smell, but yes. It's because it's a funny discussion. <laughs> Well, uh, no, because you're not absorbing all of the asparagus, and some of the asparagus that you absorb actually is utilized. Um, and so, uh, even though you do process some of the aromatic molecules from asparagus, all right. So when you consume thiocyanate, you actually consume precursors. So, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to go back to this, but yeah, I'll bet, I'll bet that there's someone out there who's written an article on chemistry about what this very is. I'll bet you there are, and we could, we could learn all about it if we really want to. Yeah, I'll bet Well, it's not really that expensive, and it grows wild in North America. It's so yeah, there's an article, it's called uh, The Unraveling of the Science Mysteries Behind Asparagus Dirt. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the brassica genus of vegetables, they contain cyanogenic glucosides that are processed to free cyanides. And then those free cyanides are further biochemically processed to thiocyanates. So you you consume from the from the vegetable cyanogenic glucosides that then are converted to cyanide, free cyanides, and then Biocyanate. So, for example, broccoli has bio glucosides that then are met metabolically converted to thiocyanate. And then that thiocyanate is what actually interacts with the, the pump and is preferentially transported into the thyroid cell. Reducing the amount of iodine that pumps <coughs> into the cell. Thioglucosides and thiocyanate. This is thiocyanate, free cyanides, thiogenic, thianogenic glucosides. If you ate too much broccoli, you would be sick. Because the use of the cyanide? Well, yeah, it does inhibit. Um, you have plenty of other iodide that comes in in your diet. That would be a lot. From what I understand, is it would be like you would, that's all you would eat would be broccoli. Just broccoli all the time. No, these are. Uh, <laughs> okay, yes, perfect. All right, so let's talk here about um, the, the feedback. So this is all related to the function of the thyroid. And so if you have reduced iodide, and even if you bind thyroid stimulating hormone, you're going to have a reduction in the amount of processing that the thyroid cells do in terms of P4, P3 um, production. Okay? But with T3, T4, once T3 and T4 are released, we do have feedback loops that are, uh, that are going to regulate 
SPS that are going to regulate the production and the release of these hormones. All right, so starting from the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus is going to target to the anterior pituitary. And the anterior pituitary is targeted by TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. And we've already talked through that. TRH stimulates TSH to be released from the anterior pituitary. This circulates to the thyroid. Which then circulates to the target tissue, <clears throat> releasing T3 and T4. Okay? So target tissue, T3, T4, TRH, TSH, uh, our <clears throat> feedback is actually going to stem from T4. So T4 will have a negative influence on TRH release and a negative influence on TSH release. T3 does not have the same feedback mechanisms as T4 on regulating the whole system. And so we end up releasing both T3 and T4 when we stimulate the thyroid. And when we stimulate the thyroid, the release results in a much higher amount of T4 in the blood. Ends up being a 20 to 1 T4 to T3 ratio under normal physiological circumstances. However, in the targets, you actually have a conversion that happens where T4 is converted either into, I'm sorry, that's not what I want to write down yet. Uh, so in the targets, we have this conversion where T4 loses one of its iodides or iodines and becomes T3, so basically gets converted to MIT-DIT, or will also be converted from T4 to dit -MIT, which is reverse T3. So even though T4 is what's produced and released in preference from the thyroid, in the targets we're still actually utilizing T3 as a, uh, as a pretty potent stimulator of the target tissue. In fact, T3 ends up being the most potent, even though its release from the thyroid is much less than, um, than T4, and it's far more potent than the first T3. Okay, so let's talk now that we kind of know a little bit about the release. TSH binds, causing several different things to happen, leading to T4, T3 release. The goitrogens and inhibitors um, are going to target things like iodine pumping and iodine incorporation. Um, and so once T3, T4 is released into the circulation, there are some important physiological roles. So one of the physiological roles that's important here is going to occur during development. So during development, we actually are going to prevent what's known as cretinism. So as we develop and age, T3 interacts with target tissues to prevent cretinism.
So cretinism, what you have here is you have two different individuals that you can see they're basically chronologically just about the same age, 48 versus 38, we'll call them adults. The 48-year-old has adult bones and adult mental capacity. The 38-year-old with cretinism has a bone capacity of five years of age, so or five years old, and then a mental capacity of 12 years. Okay. So when you have low thyroid hormones, they're in development, you would have severe growth retardation. Your growth retardation. And those low thyroid hormones lead towards a decrease in bone elongation and a decrease in bone maturation. A decrease in growth hormone secretion. And so individuals who are under this low thyroid uh, condition during development, if they are provided T3 and T4, this results in an increase in growth hormone production. However, if you add just growth hormone alone, without T3 and T4, there's little effect. So decrease in bone elongation and maturation, decrease in growth hormone secretion. We also have a decrease in the nervous system's development, as is kind of illustrated by the mental capacity here of the individual with cretinism. Decrease the nervous system development. Um, and in particular, what's observed is a decrease in axonal growth. So hopefully you remember the axon. This is the fiber that extends away from the soma and innervates to other tissues. It, it uh, leads to the terminal arbor arborization, which is the connection that makes the synapses with um, other tissues. And so we have reduction in external growth. We also, also will also have a reduction in myelination and in the process of producing myelin, which is myelogenesis. And so we're changing things like the uh, neuron's ability to transmit signals around the nervous system and around the organism. And the net result of slowed axonal growth and, and, and basically a lack of myelin production uh, is what actually causes the severe mental retardation. And so what T3, T4 does in the tissue of the brain and then the nervous system, one of the target tissues of T3, T4 nerve development, is to increase the expression of a factor known as nerve growth factor, which is going to cause melanogenesis and axon development. Um, so T3, T4 stimulates nerve growth factor in places like the brain, but also in other nervous tissues as well. So T3, T4 is one of those hormones that is going to help out the nervous system. Uh, nervous system, uh, uh, the maturation of the nervous system function. So, um, the physiology that we see in, in developing tissue 
is is um, interesting, and we basically need to have a, a bunch of different steps or a bunch of different things that happen here for the developing tissue. Uh, and one of those things is the developing tissue experiences or should undergo increases in the levels of a chemical called hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid. Having hyaluronic acid present in developing tissue causes signals to differentiate. So in other words, if you remove or reduce the presence of hyaluronic acid in developing tissues, those signals to differentiate and cause new tissues to develop, would add, the, the signals actually uh, aren't as pronounced. Hyaluronic acid, hyaluronic acid normally decreases as that differentiation process occurs. Okay. So as new tissues start with your embryonic stem cells, they become new tissues like the mesenchyme and other primordial fetal tissues. And as we go through this developmental process, hyaluronic acid becomes less and less bioavailable, becomes less and less influential. Part of the reason is, is because we start to turn on enzymes and other molecules. And one of them that we turn on is called hyaluronidase, which hyaluronic acid in the presence of hyaluronidase is converted to smaller oligos, or smaller molecules. And so it's no longer hyaluronic acid. And so that's basically how um, The signals for differentiation are going to be uh, reduced as differentiation occurs. Well, it turns out that this enzyme, hyaluronidase, its production is stimulated by the thyroid hormones. Hyaluronidase production increases with thyroid hormone uh, stimulation. So that's the developing tissue. Then as we shift over to the developed tissue, see is places like the surface of the skin that we actually still retain hyaluronic acid. If we don't have that proper hyaluronidase Reduction leading towards a reduction in hyaluronic acid. So, with the skin surface and the presence of hyaluronic uh, acid, we end up having uh, an attraction of water. And because we attract water there, water is retained in the surface of the skin, and this will form swelling. is a condition that's known as mixed edema. And so in hypothyroidism, mixed edema actually can be something that is an outward, uh, an outward occurrence for, for individuals that have gone, undergone low high, uh, full thyroid hormone production.
So when we have a decrease in thyroid hormones, this results in a decrease in that activity in the production of the enzyme. So how about a picture? So this is the same as it is. Um, the one on the thing is out here, the left, your left. So it's a lot of people in the same. They don't look like the same people at all, do they? So hypothyroidism, polyuronic acid levels are high in the skin, causing increased edema, causing that facial swelling. And then in 2009, she's actually treated for low thyroid or hypothyroidism. This turns up hyaluronic acid to develop tissue. Hyaluronic acid is converted um, and reduced uh, in, the, in, in the surface of the skin, and that swelling begins to get significant. Yeah, they don't look like the same people at all, but I promise you, you got to be the same individual one year apart after treatment for hypothyroidism. Huh? How do I know? Because this is actually an image that came out of a uh, case of clinical paper. I'm sure that's me. Yeah, so development, um, thyroid hormones play a pretty critical, um, pretty critically important role. We also have a role in thermogenesis. So with an increase in thyroid hormones, we actually are going to experience an increase in metabolic rate, okay? And so that increase in metabolic rate, that remember metabolism, what's our definition for metabolism? It's a collection of all chemical reactions occurring within a cell. And so if you increase the chemical reactions occurring in the cell, many of these, uh, many of these chemical reactions are going to require energy input. We have to have a steady supply of ATP. The best way to get ATP is at the end of the glycolytic pathway or um, ox through oxidative phosphorylation. What does oxidative ph phosphorylation require? It requires, it requires oxygen, okay? So with an increase in the thyroid hormones leading to that increase in metabolic rate, it also has a concomitant increase in oxygen consumption. the level of the mitochondria, resulting in increase in ATP to help support all of those chemical reactions. And as a result, because we've increased chemical reactions, one of the natural byproducts is the production of Yes, O2 consumption in the mitochondria, into the electron transport chain. We have a T3 receptor that's on the inner mitochondrial membrane. And so that makes that inner mitochondrial membrane responsive to T3. When you bind that T3 receptor in the inner mitochondrial membrane, or the inner mitochondrial membrane, this results in an increase in the sodium potassium ATP bases. So, sodium potassium ATP bases are going to be induced. We actually are going to, in the presence of T3, increase 
the number of these pumps. And remember that these pumps are really responsible for moving the sodium and the potassium against their concentration gradients so that our cells are always ready to respond to stimuli. And so under normal basal metabolic conditions, your sodium potassium pump are going to account for about 20 to 40 percent plus of the calories or the energy that is being utilized or the heat that's being produced. So um, we, there's actually been some studies that have been done on hypothyroid rats. Hypothyroid rats. And when you look at the mitochondria from a morphological and a functional perspective, the mitochondria in these hypothyroid rats, is that they're actually different than a non-hypothyroid rat. So hypothyroidism leads towards alterations of the mitochondria, both morphologically and functionally. So you have these morphological and these functional changes, but when we take these hypothyroid rats and we administer T3 and T4, one of the observations is that the mitochondria are observed to uptake ADP. And that's very important because ADP is our precursor to generate ATP. Right, so the, the uh, ATPase at the end of the electron transport chain, we set up that proton motor force, we have the hydrogen concentration gradient between the intermembrane space and the matrix of the mitochondria as the hydrogen flows through the ATP synthase. It's grabbing ADP and an inorganic phosphate and setting those up, basically bending the bonds that's conducive for those two precursors to combine and generate ATP. So we're now increasing ADP uptake and supplying a larger amount of precursor molecules for the production of ATP. So the thyroid has also been shown, the thyroid hormones have also been shown to affect dietary intake. So one of the things that happens with what we would call a mixed diet versus a carbohydrate rich diet is an increase in diet induced thermogenesis. diet-induced thermal genesis. When you take a look at short-term overfeeding think Thanksgiving, short-term overfeeding, serum levels of T3 increase. But we also see an increase in the conversion of T4 into T3 and a decrease in the conversion of T4 to reverse T3. Carbohydrates are going to induce thermogenesis. thermogenesis. Short-term overfeeding results in basically higher bioavailability of T3 and T4. We get rid of that conversion of T4. 
um, and we increase the conversion of T4 to T3. So serum T3 levels go up. If we look at diet without carbohydrates, one of the things that happens is there is a decrease in serum T3 levels. And then if we look at if we look at prolonged fasting. By the way, right here, type of diet. Yeah, ketogenic. So it results in T3, decrease in T3 in the serum. Uh, with prolonged fasting, we see the same thing a decrease in T3 in the serum. But we also see a decrease in T3 receptor. Number. However, that decrease is not going to occur in the central nervous system, but in other tissues it causes a decrease in T3 receptor. This results in a decrease in the metabolic rate. influence over the T3, T4, um, in particular T3 production, the T3 levels in the serum. And some of this stuff is probably not all that good. Right? So we're trying to lose weight with a ketogenic diet and this results in decreased T3 for prolonged periods of time, especially if that ketogenic diet induces a prolonged fasting like state where you don't have adequate caloric consumption, which is something that's probably more common than we'd like to admit with the ketogenic diet, you end up with some pretty severe T3 dysfunction, resulting in almost a lack of ability because of that decrease in metabolic rate to maintain body weight. This is going to result in an increase on specific tissues in body weight gain. All right, so let's take a look at the, the thyroid hormone receptors. I haven't talked too much about those receptors and brought them up so you know that they exist, but let's talk a little bit more about what these thyroid hormone receptors are going to do. So we have a receptor beta and a receptor alpha. Receptor beta we find in humans on chromosome 3. Receptor alpha is on chromosome 17. So we have two different locations genetically for the sequences for receptor beta and receptor alpha. We also are going to have alternative splicing. So alternative splicing is going to come in to play. And so what ends up happening with um, these the, the alternative splicing is I have a couple different isoforms of the beta and the alpha receptors. Many of our tissues in the body are going to express what's known as the thyroid receptor beta isoform 1 and the thyroid receptor alpha, uh, thyroid receptor alpha isoform 1. Okay? But in addition to those two isoforms in the central nervous system and in the pituitary, we're going to have thyroid receptor beta isoform 2 that's going to be present. And there is no alternative splice that creates um, a thyroid receptor alpha 2. So that's not a receptor.
it is still produced, or there is still an isoform that's produced, but it's just not a receptor. It ends up being a inhibitor of the other isoform. inhibitor of the other isoforms, and it inhibits through uh, prevention of transcription. All right, so we're going to keep track of beta 1, alpha 1, and beta 2. So thyroid receptor beta 1 beta 2, and alpha 1. They all bind T3 with a relatively high affinity. So remember I said T3 was your more potent of thyroid hormones. It's because their affinity for their receptor is, is pretty high. When we bind the thyroid receptors, this results in a activation of transcription. So we begin to generate we begin to generate new um, new transcripts that can become protein which can change the physiology in the cell. So these are classified as the physiological thyroid hormone receptors. So let's talk a little bit about the transcription activation. So we have interaction between T3 and the uh, thyroid receptor. It creates uh, what's known as multidimensional binding. Okay, multidimensional binding. And I'm going to explain what that is here in just a second. So multidimensional binding means that we can basically bind multiple T3 receptors, or the, the thyroid receptors beta 1, beta 2, and alpha 1. We can bind those together and bind those to, um, to the DNA in a variety of different versions. So there's a lot of diversity that ends up uh, possible. So we could bind the DNA as a monomer. The monomer would be a single receptor isoform binding to the DNA. When we have just a single receptor isoform that binds to the DNA, Transcriptional activity and transcriptional activation remains low. So we remain low in terms of our transcriptional activity. So monomer, you can also pr produce a homodimer. And so this is going to be two receptors that bind the DNA, but are the same isoform. When we have homodimer, so this would be, uh, for example, thyroid receptor beta 1 and thyroid receptor beta 1, they both come form this homodimer, bind to the DNA. When this happens, there is a larger activation that occurs. The thyroid hormones will also generate heterodimers. 
heterodimer, again, we're going to have two receptors that bind the DNA. This time it's two different isoforms. So a mix, maybe of beta 1 and beta 2, or beta 1 and alpha 1, etc. This creates a larger activation. And again, that's transcriptional activation. And then the last thing, or last option, is for the receptors to undergo what's known as mixed binding heterodimers. And what happens with the mixed binding heterodimer is we now have a thyroid receptor that binds to another nuclear protein partner. So this is not a, another thyroid receptor. It's another, it's another type of protein. And these two entities bind the DNA. Okay, so we're forming a heterodimer, two different molecules, that's what heterodimer means, but it's mixed binding in the terms of that it's not two thyroid receptors, it's thyroid receptor and a nuclear protein. Um, one of the more common mixed binding heterodimers is retinoid with a receptor. So retinoid acts as the nuclear protein. binds retinoic acid and then results in um, activation of yet another set of genes. Okay. So remember, thyroid hormones are similar to what we saw with sex steroids, cross through the membrane. They are lipophilic, hydrophobic, and so they cross through the membrane and then act through that intracellular mechanism where we have DNA binding and upregulation. Of gene production leading towards protein production, leading towards physiological changes. But it turns out we also have non genomic effects. Non genomic effects. So the T3T4 can have direct effects on the mitochondria. Because we have receptors that are present in the membrane, as we've already talked about. Now, when this non genomic effect occurs, where T3 binds to receptors that are present in the membrane of the mitochondria, we actually are going to have changes that occur in the mitochondria, both morphologically and functionally. So this changes how the mitochondria are going to look and how they're going to process energy production. More, oh yeah, morphological and functional changes. In the red blood cell, we also have some non-genomic effects that have been identified. So in the red blood cell, in the presence of thyroid hormones, 3T4, we have an increase in the number of calcium ATP bases. And the reason that we have determined that this is a non-genomic effect is because the effects of T3-T4 on the red blood cells resulting in the increase in calcium ATP bases, the calcium pump, the effect is not blocked by transcription. Inhibitors. So, in other words, um, if you set up an experiment like an experimental cell culture with red blood cells, 
and they provide those red blood cells, T3, T4. You see this increase in the number of calcium ATPases. A couple of things that could be happening is you could just be causing transcriptional upregulation. Uh, but when we give actinomycin D, which prevents RNA synthesis, we actually still see this number of ATPases increase. And we give pyromyosin, which pyromyosin results in premature release of the messenger RNA. Oops. messenger RNA from the ribosome to basically prevent transcription, prevent translation. We still see an increase in uh, the calcium ATPase in our red blood cells. Yeah, pyromyosin, which just prevents uh, the messenger RNA from remaining on the ribosome. just go ahead and stop there. Um, I have one last little section there that I want to talk about, but I'll save that for